Ar jauniem spēkiem esam atgriezušies zālē. So we have uh, fortified ourselves with the lunch and uh, returned to the auditorium, to the conference hall. There are some changes in the program since Birgit already made her presentation. Then uh, our next speaker will be Maya Alksne, um, director of uh, quality or quality manager from the State Forensic Science Bureau. Maya has been the quality manager for many years in the Forensic Science Bureau, and she has uh, organized our scientific um, reasoning to make sure that uh, uh, there would be a succession of um, tasks. Um, as uh, one of our experts said, uh, the weakest link in the chain is uh, bound to burst, so we try to um, avoid having such weak links in our chain of expertise. But Maya will not speak about the weak links in the chain. Um, some of us already mentioned video conferencing. It is the 21st century. Uh, a, con a conversation with the expert can be held um, s uh, with the help of a video conference and uh, the State Forensic Science Bureau provides for video conferences with experts uh, to economize our time, to make sure that uh, we can work more effectively. Besides, in a video conference, we can demonstrate all the materials in the courtroom from the point where the expert is located. This is an advantage, too. And from year to year, um, the uh, video conferences are uh, becoming increasingly common. Uh, sometimes uh, we have very busy days. Uh, usually it is the middle of the week when the judges are working very actively, and we cannot provide for all the video conferences requested. And therefore, we are uh, thankful if uh, the judges tell us that uh, we want to in interrogate the expert at this time, uh, naming particular time, instead of uh, making us um, to be on call and uh, uh, be ready from the beginning of the uh, court hearings in the morning uh, for the whole day. And as we discussed uh, uh, the proceedings, uh, the procedure of work, um, and uh, uh, how an expert uh, can share his findings, uh, then uh, it is uh, very convenient to use a video conference. Of course, the documenting of all this is still your responsibility. It has to be documented uh, properly. And now, uh, Maya Alksne will tell you how experts' uh, opinions are uh, provided in video conferencing regime. Good afternoon, dear guests of the conference, lecturers. My topic is experts' uh, testimony in the video conference, as I was introduced, and she also, um, the, our moderator, uh, managed to um, uh, already present most of my topic and my presentation, but uh, I chose this uh, topic because video conferences have been used for many years already, and for all this time, the State Forensic Science Bureau has provided uh, video conferences in its premises, making it possible for uh, various experts to take part in the court hearings in the video conferencing regime. And uh, the um, staff of the uh, office are performing the duties of authorized persons, and they have accumulated experience which they want to share in this presentation. Uh, first, I would like to briefly dwell on the status of expert and witness and the differences between the two statuses, and then uh, a little overview of the history of uh, using video conferencing in court hearings will follow. And finally, I would like to share the experience of the Bureau and our observations uh, in um, providing video conferences. Participating uh, in video conferences and organizing video conferences, we have found some issues uh, which uh, we must uh, uh, keep in our focus. Uh, perhaps I will repeat some of the information uh, voiced uh, in the morning session already, but 
since I want to uh, point at the differences, uh, this is important to reiterate, perhaps. Uh, first of all, we must understand who is an expert and who is a witness. And in view of the fact that experts are usually invited to uh, the courts in criminal proceedings, then I will speak about the criminal procedure. According to the uh, law on criminal procedure, an expert is an official who, according to uh, the criminal procedure law, ha is authorized to uh, uh, perform criminal procedure on behalf of the state. And experts uh, reporting or an uh, expert's report can be uh, an evidence in the criminal proceedings concerning the facts and circumstances, which is submitted in uh, the criminal procedure uh, in a written form by the involved expert. And experts uh, are individuals who have specialist knowledge in some um, area of uh, um, science, uh, uh, technologies, art, or craft and uh, who have the right to provide expertise um, in the uh, procedure stipulated by the law. Uh, the, uh, there is um, a law on the court experts uh, which provides that uh, in exceptional cases other individuals can provide expertise who have not um, acquired, obtained the certificate of a court expert but who have specialist knowledge in the specific area. Uh, the information about the court experts can be found in the uh, register of uh, court experts. Um, the address has been provided here on the slide. And in the internet, uh, a register or list of methods used in expertise has also been published and is available. Uh, this uh, list uh, uh, includes all the methods used by court experts. As to the um, testimony provided by expert, uh, the uh, uh, prosecution uh, may ask uh, an expert to uh, testify in the case in order to uh, uh, find out uh, the expert uh, opinion about uh, the, um, questions uh, uh, related to the case which do not require for additional research or investigation. And the law also provides that uh, the expert has to be interrogated according to the uh, regulations uh, which uh, apply to uh, interrogation of witnesses. However, the expert doesn't lose his status in the process. In the context of this uh, presentation, uh, it is worthwhile uh, to look at the status of a witness and to see the differences from an expert status. A witness is a person who is invited to provide information about the uh, circumstances uh, which have to be proven in a specific criminal procedure um, and uh, has to pro provide information about uh, the circumstances uh, and facts and uh, uh, auxiliary facts related to the case. Uh, and we have to see the difference where uh, the person um, is interrogated as a witness and where they are interrogated as an expert. As it has been mentioned earlier, uh, the prosecution can ask uh, uh, the expert to testify uh, in certain cases. On the other hand, if uh, uh, the expert has to be interrogated not uh, in order to uh, obtain uh, information which is provided for uh, in uh, the article uh, quoted above concerning the uh, t duty or, duty or uh, role of the expert in the criminal proceedings, the expert can also uh, be a witness uh, in the criminal proceedings. Uh, but is there is a difference um, in both statuses, and uh, the criminal procedure uh, also provides that the expert has the right to ask questions uh, to persons who are being interrogated in, during the court hearings, uh, which also uh, confirms that uh, expert does not have to be asked uh, to leave the room, uh, the courtroom during the court hearings. Um, this uh, lengthy introduction was needed just to help to understand the last part of my presentation better. 
Uh, further on, I would like to tell you briefly about the history of introduction of video conferences and their status. From 2009 uh, to 2013, uh, the court administration implemented a project uh, together with uh, the Swiss colleagues, um, modernization of courts in Latvia. Uh, in the framework of this project, uh, 47 courts of Latvia and 12 uh, um, penitentiary institutions uh, uh, were equipped with video conferencing equipment. In total, uh, those were 323 rooms. All of the court rooms were equipped with audio recording equipment. Three video conferencing uh, equipment uh, units were purchased by the state expertise uh, bureau and one video conferencing bureau by the psych, uh, psychiatric hospital Daugavpils. And video conferencing permits uh, to uh, reduce the time which uh, is spent in preparing the defendants uh, for the court hearings. It improves the public safety. It uh, provides uh, opportunities to participate in the court hearings, the uh, postponed uh, hearings, uh, uh, or the number of postponed hearings are decreased. Uh, the uh, need to uh, convoy the um, <coughs> detained uh, um, suspects uh, to the courtroom uh, is not necessary anymore. It also allows uh, to use uh, experts' time more effectively and to uh, demonstrate visuals, diagrams, other visual materials uh, to, in order to explain the experts' uh, report. For example, experts uh, can use uh, computer modeling to uh, show visually the um, traffic accident in question. Since uh, 2012, uh, the State uh, Court Expertise Forensic Science Bureau um, provides uh, video conferencing uh, for court experts. During these years, experts' participation in the form of video conferencing has been provided in 757 court hearings. 83% um, of them have been criminal cases, 15% civil cases, and 2% administrative cases. And um, representatives of the State Forensic Science Bureau have taken part uh, as authorized persons uh, in all of these video conferences, and we have accumulated experience and conclusions, which we would like to share. Here you can see the statistics from 2012 till September of 2018. You see the number of video conferences from various institutions. You can see that um, the uh, State Forensic Science Bureau and uh, the Psychiatric uh, Hospital uh, center, uh, the uh, psychiatric and uh, addiction center has uh, have held uh, almost an equal number of conferences. Uh, the medical professionals have held a f lower number of uh, conferences, and uh, private individuals have had a sm really small number of video conferences. Here you see statistics by court. Um, districts. In Riga region, Jurmala is a leader, which has provided 42 conferences, video conferences over these years. Kurzeme region, most video conferences have been organized from uh, Lipa district court. Zemgal region, Uh, Yalgava District Court is an absolute leader here. Vidzeme Court region. The situation is similar, but uh, the Cesis District Court is a, is a leader. And Latgale region, uh, where Daugavpils Court is the leader. In what cases do we use the video conference? When we need to provide uh, testimonials from forensic experts, when we need to find out other opportunities, 
when there's a repeated procedure, when we need to clarify something, when you need to find out specific things. I can just provide an example. We had a forensic um, expertise for handwriting in a civil matter. And we had the question whether this uh, document was filled in by a specific person. We had an opinion from the forensic expert, and there was a fixed price per expertise, 145 euro. Uh, the person who wanted uh, the result was not satisfied with the result, and they um, commissioned another expertise from another expert. And uh, they sent 10 documents instead of one. So uh, the price increased accordingly. That was uh, 100, uh, um, 1,400 instead of 140 euro. And uh, this uh, created some confusion because uh, uh, the party in the civil case afterwards didn't want to pay for the expertise that was performed. And uh, that was a very funny matter because, well, the additional um, opinions were quite unnecessary. They only needed to find out about one document. There are also other interesting cases, for example, regarding um, drugs, regarding different medications. We have had our experts go into Estonia, for example, um, where they needed to provide uh, their expert opinion on these matters. And in the future, we believe we could just use video conferences. Sometimes uh, the um, expert is uh, invited to a pretrial meeting where they need to explain their scales of evaluation, their criteria, and so on and so forth. And um, this uh, usually occurs at the office in person, but it could also be held um, by a video conference, this type of pre-trial meeting with the expert. Now, a few words about our practical experience in ensuring that the video conference runs smoothly. There are a few things that we have observed. During video conferences, we see that the expert is invited as a witness even though they are testifying about their forensic opinion. So um, quite unjustly and unnecessarily, the forensic expert is put into the place of a regular witness. And that's not just something uh, that we can bear. We know that um, court announce, uh, announces a particular time when uh, uh, the trial starts, and uh, then uh, the expert needs to sit at the ready at the other end of the video conference. Uh, the feed is cut off, and uh, they just start uh, sitting uh, in front of the computer at the beginning of the trial, and they wait until they need to respond. That's a quite useless waste of the expert's time, in my opinion. What are the experts' rights? Uh, the forensic expert provides opinion on uh, the questions they ask and other connects matters. But um, we need to understand that even uh, though the uh, forensic expert may listen to the testimonials of other witnesses and uh, of um, the defendant, or the claimant, this cannot influence uh, what they're going to say because uh, the forensic expert needs to only say the things that are the results of their professional expertise, their logical reasoning. That's the result, their report. And that's the only thing they're allowed to say. So this brings us to the question, do we need to send the forensic expert away? Do we need to give them out of um, Court. And uh, sometimes uh, the judges don't mind that uh, the um, forensic expert stays during the proceedings uh, in the room. But uh, there's also the opportunity to determine another procedure for verifying the evidence. 
sometimes the forensic expert is interrogated the last. But um, there's also a good practice of uh, interrogating the forensic expert in the very beginning because this enables the judge to determine what's going to be the right sequence for listening to other testimonials and uh, evaluating other pieces of evidence. Quite often, we feel that the participation of the you know, forensic scientist uh, during the trial is uh, nothing but a formality because uh, the only question that um, uh, you're being asked is, do you um, confirm what you have written in your report? And that's it. That's the only thing that you asked uh, in person. But um, this question is, in fact, quite useless because um, the forensic expert obviously cannot change what they have written in the report. They cannot um, perform another examination or another analysis on the fly during the trial for everyone to see and then suddenly change the report. So the question seems quite uh, useless to me. Quite often, uh, the forensic expert does not get any specific questions, only very general and vague ones, and there's nothing to answer, really. Recently, we've had an example of a video conference that only lasted 90 seconds. So the forensic expert was asked, do you confirm your report? The expert said, yes, I confirm. That's it. The feed cuts off, and uh, the forensic expert does not get any more questions from the judge. That's it. That's the only thing they're interested in. Sometimes uh, forensic experts are getting asked questions that do not fall within the realm of their competence. Or they are getting asked questions that don't really require any uh, specialized knowledge. Like, for example, they asked who um, determines the methods. Or they're getting asked such questions that are very basic, that uh, could be clarified just by opening a um, textbook for school children. And uh, these questions, again, would be quite useless because they are basic things that you can check uh, by looking into a high school curriculum, for example. And uh, there's the law on forensic experts where you can check uh, the procedures for determining the methods and so on and so forth. So that uh, the forensic expert does not need to rehash the things that do not concern the job. I think I forgot to change the slide, sorry. Should the expert answer all the questions they're being asked? Indeed, that's a very good question because a lot of questions do not concern the case. And uh, sometimes uh, the forensic expert is being protected, like by the judge, for example, from these unnecessary questions, and sometimes they aren't. Sometimes uh, the forensic expert is being asked questions that were not asked in the beginning. But here you need to understand that if you have new questions that you need to clarify via forensic um, examination, then you just need to commission a new examination. So you, you cannot expect the forensic expert to provide answers on the spot, just on the fly like that. Sometimes the forensic expert uh, gets um, reproached uh, for not having the answers to these unforeseen questions, but they shouldn't have these answers because the questions weren't asked, so the procedure was not performed. Um, the forensic expert is not uh, a telepath. Sometimes uh, the forensic expert is uh, being asked, what should one do in a specific situation? Sometimes uh, the, there are very protracted discussions uh, about matters that do not pertain to the report, to the evaluative report of the forensic experts. And what's the point in those discussions, really? We know that forensic experts um, frequently tell the stories of um, parties trying to emotionally manipulate them. And that indeed happens. 
For example, during the trial, um, people question the professional competence and qualifications of the forensic expert. Uh, the forensic expert gets reproaches about uh, the methods um, that uh, perhaps they should have used a method that is used in another laboratory and that would have given better results and so on and so forth. So there's this kind of emotional pressing and manipulation. For example, there can be cases when the forensic expert is being examined during the trial, like they are getting asked questions. For example, a doctor of medicine needs to prove that they know what uh, the interior organs of a human being are and when they are located and so on. And um, well, this can be very emotional. We can also have other cases uh, of uh, an attempt of at emotional manipulation. When there was a case where a person um, was in a critical situation due to their own behavior and uh, uh, the opinion of the forensic expert was contested and um, uh, the attorney tried to influence the forensic expert saying that, uh, well, depending on the conclusions of the forensic expert, um, this could influence the further development of the case and the person could lose their apartment. So there was this kind of emotional bullying from the attorney. Sometimes attorneys do doubt um, the conclusions um, to which the forensic experts arrive. And um, the attorney says, even a non-specialist uh, can see that these signatures are different. So they completely disregard the evidence provided uh, by the forensic expert. And uh, the attorney says, well, a non-specialist can see that this uh, is obviously the same thing when we clearly know that this is not obvious and there are procedures to determine one thing or another. More things we have observed during video conferences. Uh, when trial does not start when it should. Alas, this happens. Uh, sometimes judges uh, leave a bit of uh, leeway for themselves. Well, sometimes um, the beginning is delayed. Uh, the accompanying letter does not uh, have information about institutions uh, to which uh, the expert is attached or other additional information. Sometimes um, the forensic expertise uh, institutions uh, uh, reproach the office that uh, they're not informed about um, the trial itself. But the office only takes care of the video conference. Informing the experts that they need to take part in the trial is not the responsibility of uh, our, our, the office. Um, sometimes experts uh, come to a trial in person and they don't inform uh, the office that they're not going to attend the video conference. Uh, sometimes the experts don't uh, bring uh, their report with them, so they forget the document itself. And uh, uh, sometimes the responsibilities, the duties of uh, um, the person are not clearly outlined. So what kind of information needs to be uh, documented, what uh, the minutes should be, and so on. Now, very briefly, I will wrap up. The here, I have enumerated those uh, points which we find important to have an effective video conference. Uh, it is important for the court to uh, book the time for video conferencing in advance, to provide uh, written information to uh, the Bureau of Forensic Science and to the expert, uh, also to provide the information in writing about cancelling the video conference, uh, precisely uh, set uh, the time of interrogation for the expert. Uh, the closed uh, hearings has to be provided if it is uh, uh, so prescribed, and uh, all the uh, participants of the courtroom must have uh, an explanation about the expert's uh, um, report available. Thank you, Maya. We have a request from the audience, those who are listening to 
uh, the interpretation in Latvian. Please uh, uh, either put your uh, headphones or hearing aid devices uh, on your ears, or if you are if you have them on your uh, neck, in, uh, then in, then please uh, turn the volume off because uh, that interpreting. Uh, and starts uh, hearing the original presentations in the original language. And now our next speaker is uh, Kelly Sheridan uh, from uh, Northumbria University in Newcastle, the UK. She works as a senior lecturer in forensic science. She is also a consultant uh, on fibers. Uh, Kelly uh, man manages a f fiber forum in the UK. If I am not mistaken, and she also uh, works in a working group of fibers and hairs of forensic uh, uh, expert experts or forensic science experts uh, organization. Kelly has extensive experience not only in identifying and research of fibers, but also in val evaluation of the experts' findings. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you very much for the invitation to present here today. Um, I hope you will get something from it and take something away. I'm going to build on the presentations that we've had earlier from um, two forensic experts, one from the UK and, and another from Sweden. And my job is a little bit easier because they've done all the hard work. So hopefully, my, by the end of today in this presentation, it, I want to put the evaluation of forensic evidence into a more um, manageable way, more applied. Forensic evidence in, in court is ultimately added value. We want to add value to the court proceedings and the investigation. And I'd like to start by thinking about that and how we can use forensic science to do that um, and ultimately in, provide you with a case example of, of how to do so. I'm going to talk a little bit more about textile fibers rather than other evidence types because that's my area of, of expertise. And also it's a bit of a forgotten evidence type. Okay. When we think about a forensic investigation, we think about it in the UK as two separate parts of a puzzle. The first part is what we refer to as the investigative part. And ultimately that happens prior to a suspect being apprehended. It tends to be performed through the police officer's investigation and it revolves around a crime. Often their question is, who committed the crime? When we are in this mode, we are using forensic evidence, forensic science, to try to um, provide the police with a suspect to lead the investigation. And often we provide explanations for findings. Once a uh, suspect has been apprehended, we then move on to the evaluative section of forensic evidence. And so essentially, this is where our propositions come in that we talked about earlier. So the prosecution provides a proposition that um, the suspect sexually assaulted the lady. The defense is saying something different. And using the forensic evidence, we are evaluating which one is more likely. Okay? And hopefully we can, I'll show you examples of how forensic evidence and textile fibers are used um, for both of these modes. We talked earlier about expectations. Jonathan mentioned expectations. 
In order to add value of forensic science, add value to your um, investigative process, we need to use the right piece of forensic evidence. And what I refer to this is the toolbox. If you needed to hang a picture on the wall and you wanted to put a nail in the wall, you would choose a spanner, uh, sorry, a hammer as a tool to put the nail in the wall. You would so select the correct tool from the box. This is how we should think of forensic science. And often, the reason forensic science doesn't add as much value as it can is because the wrong tool has been selected. And a key to this is thinking about it in terms of expectations and what the key questions are in the case. So this is, at the, this is in the investigative part of the investigation, okay? The key question you may ask is who, okay? If the key question in the investigation is who was the perpetrator, you may choose to investigate fingerprints as an evidence type because that identifies a person. You may choose DNA because that identifies a person. If, on the other hand, you want to know when something happened, fingerprint evidence and DNA evidence will not progress your investigation because a fingerprint can be left at any time. If the defendant has a reason for their fingerprint or their DNA being at a crime scene, its presence does not help you in determining whether or not when that crime happened, when they left that DNA. The key question may be how something happened. And again, if we think about DNA, you don't know how the DNA was left often. You may use a more, uh, a, a, an application of DNA. You may look at blood, which, of which you can obtain somebody's DNA, but move on to look at blood pattern analysis to determine how that pattern came to be on that wall in that particular fashion. So when we talk about expectations, we have to think about what would help the case. So if I give you an example of this, if we are, go back to the sexual assault situation and we are trying to determine whether um, a person was raped, if the argument is consensual, one, one party is saying, um, I was raped, the other party is saying they agreed to sex, DNA, finding that person's DNA on the other person is not going to move your investigation forward. Okay? So choose a different tool that will, will help. You may, for example, want to look at uh, the person's clothing to see if there's any tears to which would suggest a level of violence. Textile fibers can help with all of these things. You may not believe me about who, but hopefully I can explain a, a, a little bit more. Jonathan also mentioned earlier about data. And in handwriting, there is not a lot of data that can be relied upon by the expert. Fortunately, in textile fibers, there is, and I will hopefully show to you how we can use that data in our everyday uh, evaluation of forensic evidence. Okay. Often the question that, that we get asked in court when we are presenting fibre evidence is one of commonality. How common is something? So if we have blue polyester fibres that match blue polyester fibres from a pair of Nike tracksuit bottoms, 
The question is, there are thousands and thousands of Nike tracksuit bottoms that are made of the same fibers. So how do you know it was this particular pair owned by the suspect? <coughs> okay. So this is just a, an example of some of the, the, the studies, the research that has gone into addressing this exact question. Okay. First of all, there are questions of how common something is. So we can go out and we can perform a study and we can say categorically that the most common fibre type we would encounter are grey cotton fibres. On the opposite end of the scale, an orange polyester fibre is rare. So looking around this room, there is a lot of dark clothing. A lot of that clothing will be made from cotton, but I don't think I see anybody wearing anything orange. Okay? But that is just on a general level. The next question that we can ask is, using the techniques in the lab, how well can we distinguish between one blue polyester fibre from another? The research says that, that our techniques are very sophisticated in doing that. But the real question that we have to ask, and what this paper is based upon, is what are the chances of finding an exact match? That's what we really want to know. To make this a little bit more clear, I'm going to give you an example of cars. Many of you will drive. Instead of using the blue polyester fibres, if we think about a blue car, if I ask the question of you, are blue cars common? You would probably say, yes. Okay? But if we start to think about what that means, we can, the question may be, which colour blue? If we look at all the blue in the room at the moment, they're all very different shades. If we think of the cars, they're different shades. If you owned a blue car and you scratched it and you wanted to fix it, you wouldn't walk into the local shop and just pick blue paint off the wall. You have to match the colour to the shades of the car. The structure of the car is important. What is the make? It could be a BMW. A BMW is not the same as a Vauxhall. It's not the same as a Jeep. The model, a BMW, there's several different types of models of BMWs. So you see straight away when we start stripping this back, there's lots of levels that the forensic scientists will consider when they're trying to evaluate how common or rare a fibre type is. But the key question when I asked what the chances are of finding this, if you take a specific car, so if I look here and I say, okay, I think I've chosen one with no blue cars in, so that, that's not a good start. <laughs> Um, if we move to red, okay, we choose this red car here. If I take, a, take that as a whole, imagine that's a, a red fiber, what my question, what you are ultimately trying to ask me in court is, if I stood on a busy motorway at five o'clock on Monday the 25th of January 2019, how likely is it that I will find that exact match of that car? The chances of that happening are very, very slim. Of course, as the commonality of that type of fibre increases, so do the chances of encountering it. But the studies, that, the study I showed you earlier, there are many of them that have been done, where we have gone out and taken a garment, we have analysed the fibres, and then we have sampled lots of random places, clothing, seats on vehicles, cinema seats, many locations, and we have tried to look for an exact match to the, 
target fibre. The studies show the chances of finding that are very, very slim. And if you do find it on the rare occasion, you may only find one or two matching fibres. So what that says to me is, if I find a large number of matching fibres in a case, the, the, if I am considering my two propositions on, of whether the fibres are more likely to come from this suspect garment or another garment, I'm much more in favour of, of the fibres having come from the suspect garment. Okay? Now, because we're asking where the fibres come from, that is what we call source level. And you had heard earlier about addressing things at source level. Activity refers to how the fibres got there. So we've, we've thought about where they come from, but now we want to know how did they get there. And this is a key, key added value the textile fibres can provide to an investigation. There's a lot of studies that have been conducted that we refer to as transfer and persistence studies. And by looking at the properties of fibres, we can um, address how likely fibres are to transfer to something and how likely we are to find them, i.e., how do they fall off. This is an example of a, a recent research project that, that I ran with some undergraduate students. And it's nothing um, groundbreaking. It just adds more data that we can use in court. It supports lots of the previous other studies. And essentially what it says is when fibres have transferred to something, over time they fall off. Common sense, right? What we're seeing here is this is data where we have simulated a kicking action in an assault. So we have taken three types of shoes, one which is a, a fabric-based training shoe, a leather-based training shoe, and a pair of leather boots. And we have kicked something, and we have looked at how many fibres transfer and how long it is before they fall off. And what, what, is there any difference that we can, we can use to, to help in an investigation? What the data tells us is the fibres, if we think of this is 100% is at time zero when all of the fibres have been transferred. Okay? Over time, the fibres fall away. So quite quickly, the f we are losing quite a lot of fibres. So by one hour, 60 minutes we have lost about 20%, 80% of fibres have been lost. That's standard. Now, that sounds quite bad in terms of evidence. Why would you bother looking for fibres if that's the case? But what you don't know is how many this equates to. If this equates to a million fibres, losing 80% is fine. Okay? Yeah? But what we are seeing through this data is it depends upon the shoe. If you have the fabric shoe, they hold fibres for longer. Okay? So you're more likely to find them in a situation. So in a case, when we're talking about expectations, if you have a case that involves kicking and you, you, you can see the, the construction of the shoe, you may say, okay, that's a fabric shoe. A, it may be worth looking for fibres. A leather shoe, my expectations are reduced. Maybe we should look at something else. Okay, so that's how we can use the data to inform our expectations, to inform which forensic type will be best suited to the key question in the case. How something happened. Okay. This is a case that I worked on a few years ago. Um, it was the strangulation of uh, uh, a woman in her home. The suspect was the lady's daughter's boyfriend. He lived in the house 
up until two weeks prior to her death. He and the daughter found the, de found the dead body. They entered the property, they saw her on the floor, they call her the, the, the police. Okay. What you are seeing here is a process that we refer to as one-to-one -one taping. And the reason it's called that is each little square on this diagram of, of the body equates to a single piece of adhesive tape. Okay? So what you can see here is essentially a map of where the fibres transferred onto the lady from the questioned perpetrator's clothing. The, green, the, the, the clothing article that we are referring to was a brown coat, an, an outer coat. It was made from three different types of fibres. Brown cotton fibres, brown polyester fibres, and a second different type of brown polyester fibres. The green dots refer to the, um, the brown cotton. The red dots refer to uh, the brown polyesters, which actually came from the inside lining of the coat. And the blue dots are brown polyesters that came from the cuffs of the coat. So if I told you that information and how that was constructed and asked you to interpret what is most likely to have happened based on this map, it's quite visual. And straight away you can see that the concentration of fibres is up around the back and down the arms here. It doesn't take a genius to work out what action is more likely to have happened. So if we think about our propositions... The prosecution proposition may be the person wearing that coat strangled the victim. The defence proposition would be, I didn't strangle her, I found her. Okay? She was already on the floor, I came in, I checked she was dead, I called 999. It wasn't me. Which one do you think is more likely? First one? Yes. So when we're talking about likelihood ratios, expectations, propositions, it sounds quite scary. But actually, it's just the tipping scales. You are just applying your knowledge, your, the data that you, you can find in, in, with research studies, your experience, and the findings of the case, along with the facts of the case, to ask yourself which one is more likely. And the scale is just your confidence in how likely that one is versus another. Okay? Now, in most situations, because the person, the, the suspect found the victim, transfer, uh, textile fibres would not have been a consideration. Yeah? Because you may say, I would expect to find fibres. But by performing this one-to-one -one taping at the scene and not disturbing the body, we were able to provide a map to show an action. So, this is what we mentioned earlier. So, we think about our evaluation, our propositions, as the hierarchy of propositions. They get more meaningful as we move down the scale. Okay? So at source level, we're asking, where did the fibres originate from? Are they more likely to have originated from this particular garment or another garment made of those fibres? Okay? That might be informative. But in that particular case I just told you about, would that help. If we go back to this, and in court you said to me, how likely do those brown cotton fibres, how likely is it that those brown cotton fibres come from this suspect garment? And I would say there is strong support that it is that garment rather than another garment. 
that doesn't help you answer whether or not he strangled her, does it? Okay? So where possible, we try, well, where possible, in almost all situations, we try to address at activity level because we add value to the evidence. What you want to know is not whether the fibres come from the jacket, but the action involved. Did he strangle her? Okay. The question, did he kill her, is not for me. That is what we are moving into. That I refer to it as offence. The Brigitte talked to as crime level. That is for the court in the UK. That is for the jury to determine. That is not for me. Okay. So how does this work in practice? Let's talk about a particular case. This was a case um, that I worked on in 2010, and it was the murder of a young girl called Joanna Yates. It was a very high-profile case, primarily because she was a young, white, middle-class woman who went missing unexpectedly. It happened just before Christmas, and so, obviously, at Christmas, it's a time for family, um, so it pulled on people's heartstrings, and, and there was a big investigation to find um, her missing body, or to find her, I should say, originally. So, she, she, went, um, she went to work on a Friday on the 17th of December with her boyfriend, who she lived with, after work, her boyfriend went away for the weekend to visit his parents. She went to the pub with her, with her work colleagues for a Christmas drink. Um, she left the pub and CCTV spotted her um, at various locations. So she left the pub at 8 o'clock. She was then spotted at a, a supermarket at 10 past eight, where she bought a bottle of cider, and then she was spotted um, at another supermarket where she bought a pizza. In the flat, her boyfriend returned on Sunday evening. He couldn't get hold of her all weekend, and in the flat were, were her, her, her work clothing, her outer clothing, and, and her purse, her bag. The cider was there, it had been opened and half drunk, and the pizza was missing. The pizza became a big thing in the media. I don't really know why, but it, it, was, it became Operation Find the Pizza. This is what she was wearing. Um, this is from a, one of the CCTV images. So you can see she has um, her outer clothing is a ski jacket, and underneath she's wearing something green. These were both found in the flat. Um, the, the green was a, a body warmer. Okay. Her body was found on the 25th of December. So I, I, always, I will never forget the day I was watching the TV with my family when the, the news came through that her, her body was found. You knew instantly that it was her. So that was a busy time for the lab. Um, as you can imagine, this is the investigative stage. So they are, the police are trying to establish who. Obviously, the boyfriend was a suspect. Turns out not to be him. I shall keep you from your suspense. Um, so DNA was the priority, as it rightly should have been in that situation. She, was, she had been strangled. She had a small cut, a bit of blood on her nose, a bit of a graze on her face. She was fully clothed, but, but uh, wearing the clothes that she wore for work. So she had a pair of tight, skinny jeans on, a very pale pink T-shirt, all intact, other than her T-shirt was lifted over um, one of her breasts, exposing her bra. One sock was missing. The police took lots of samples from her, um, and they, they determined that she hadn't been sexually assaulted. And because her jeans were so tight, they didn't think she had been interfered with. So they sampled her clothing for DNA. 
Um, I should give you a little bit more of a backstory about that. Where she was found, she was found on the side of a road, and there was blood on the wall. There was a wall maybe up to here, maybe a bit higher, and beyond the wall was a quarry, disused quarry. She was dumped at the side of the road, and what the police think happened is, is the, 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 the perpetrator tried to throw her over the wall, but he couldn't lift her up. So the... The injuries on her face were because she bashed the wall um, and she, she was left there, he left her there. It snowed at the time, so she was covered in snow and leaves, which is why she wasn't found for a, for, for a few days. So, in terms of targeting DNA, am I okay for time? Quick, okay. Uh, for, for DNA, they target specific areas. So if you are going to lift somebody up, where do you touch them? So the backs of the knees, the back of the head maybe, they targeted those areas to look for DNA. They identified the, uh, um, her landlord who lived in the same block of flats as her, as the, the perpetrator. And they compared the DNA to his and they did not get any matches. So they, they were running out of time because this was a very uh, prominent case. So they asked, is there any information that we could give to them with fibres to help look at the suspect's clothing? He had lots of clothing in the wardrobe and they wanted to, uh, to, to narrow it down to a particular garment or a set of garments. So I looked at the outsides of her clothing to see if there was anything that we could use. And what I found were a, a group of very unusual fibres. They were cotton fibres that ha were coloured, but within the centre of the cotton fibre, there, there were colourless parts. So it would be coloured, colourless, coloured. And there were lots of different colours. So there were red, maroon, red cotton fibres, but also blue cotton fibres. And because of the colourless part that was the same as them, it's fair to assume that these fibres have originated from the same garment, so that means a colourful garment. If we look at this fibre in particular, you can see how it changes colour along the length. Okay? Now, there were so many fibres that what we... What we were able to say from this is these fibres came from something that she was in regular contact with, and it was recent because the number of them was so high. Our transfer and persistence studies tell us that high numbers of fibres indicate recent um, and regular contact. It's a multicoloured item, and because of the type of fibre, we know what the garment will be made from. Because she was transferred to the side of the road, the police believe she was transported in a vehicle, in a boot. So from this, what I can say is whatever boot she was put into, these fibres would be found because they would have transferred from her to the boot. Okay. This was the man they identified, the, the, the landlord. Um, there was nothing in his boot. Expectations, what I've just told you, if she had been in his boot, I would expect to find those fibres there. They were not there. That, therefore, supports the defence proposition that she, she has not been in her boot. It's not inconclusive. It supports the defence. So we were able to rule him out. Another neighbour of hers, Vincent Tabak, was later identified, and there were lots of those fibres in his boot. Okay? This is the investigation. We help with fibres to steer from an intelligence point of view of how they could identify the suspect. Once we identify the suspect, the next thing is, what is his defence? What does he say? Does he say, I've never had contact with her before? In which case, why are the fibres there? Or has he got some other reasonable explanation for the fibres being there? If he has, that is what we need to evaluate and we should consider. Um, these were the sources of the fibres. It was her bedding. Um, to cut a long story short, there was complications of this. He had, a sim he, he had bedding that also displayed the same characteristics of cotton fibres. These were both from Ikea, hence why they're similar. Um, 
Once we have identified the suspect and we're trying to evaluate at activity level how these fibres got there, the prosecution hypothesis is that they were transferred because um, he had contact with her, he strangled her. The defence proposition, actually, he said he's never spoke to her. Although they live within the same block of flats, they've never spoken, they've never had contact. So for me, that's quite easy. Okay? But what we tried to do was then establish, when we knew it was him, then we looked at his clothing, we looked at other pieces of evidence to try and um, determine the whole picture. This was one of my drawings trying to understand what the evidence could mean. So, last slide. What did we do in that case? We used, from an investigation point of view, we used fire textile evidence to eliminate one suspect and identify the other. That's identifying who. When we knew who it was, we then looked at how the fibres could be transferred and when that transfer happened. We had large numbers of fibres, we had a variety of fibre types, and we had transfer in both directions. When we take all of these into consideration, <coughs> it is much more likely that these fibres were in his boot as a result of recent and direct contact rather uh, than not. Okay? And I think the strength of evidence in this case was probably extremely strong support because there was so much evidence weighing against him. Okay. So hopefully, in summary, I'm able to uh, show you how fibres can have value to a forensic investigation, but also giving you some perspective to think about what is the right for tool, what is the right, what is the question you're asking, and what is the right tool that will address that particular question. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Kelly. Um, par cik laiks mums ļoti, ļoti dzenas priekš, es neiedziļināju. Since uh, time is running and uh, uh, I will not uh, uh, sink into the uh, history, uh, but uh, this person has said uh, justice has to be uh, essentially, but not formally, and uh, the speaker uh, who comes next uh, will speak about experts' report, uh, which has to be uh, e essential, provide essential information. So Salvi Svarpinch is the next speaker, a lawyer from Latvia. Good afternoon, uh, colleagues and non-colleagues. We all have a sole purpose here uh, to achieve a, a better uh, administration of justice in this country, and perhaps uh, I could provide the perspective of a defense lawyer um, about uh, the forensic expertise and what it should be. Uh, first of all, I will speak about uh, the position of the European Court of Human Rights, uh, then uh, the position of uh, Latvian legislation, and then practical uh, op um, opportunities. The European Convention on Human Rights what is important for defense is section 3.d, uh, which says that everyone who is accused of a criminal offense has the right uh, to uh, investigate or uh, in interrogate uh, the witnesses of, uh, uh, of, uh, of uh, prosecution. Um, why is this important? Looking at the doctrine of the European Court of Human Rights, uh, in point D of section uh, six, part three, there are three elements. The first uh, is uh, the right to dispute uh, the uh, witnesses of prosecution. Uh, and under this point, uh, there is this, a possibility to uh, verify other evidence uh, which has been submitted by the uh, prosecution. There are other sub-points, two other sub-points, 
uh, which uh, um, speak about uh, the right to um, testify and to summon uh, one's own witnesses in, for defense. Uh, here uh, uh, we have a quotation of uh, a document which is also based in the practice of uh, the uh, European Court of Human Rights. In any investigation process, uh, the investigation um, collects uh, a certain amount of evidence, and in the courtroom in the, during the trial, the defense lawyer can finally start uh, to um, um, try to achieve uh, um, the manifestation of, of equal rights of both parties uh, to uh, ask for uh, additional witnesses and to uh, hear additional uh, testimonies. Another area uh, where we uh, deal with expertise is uh, uh, Section 13, um, which uh, provides for um, protection of uh, effective, effective defense or providing of effective defense. And this uh, section speaks about effective investigation and renewal of uh, uh, the person's rights if uh, they have been uh, infringed. And here uh, we have a section uh, uh, concerning uh, the uh, providing of uh, uh, expertise, uh, the right to expertise, and this concerns uh, the expertise which has been uh, carried out superficially, erroneously, or there are some other defects in providing evidence. I would also like to refer to the uh, handbook, uh, Good Practice Guide uh, for Computer-Based Electronic Evidence for the UK police officers. This concerns electronic evidence. Um, and expertise, but it contains one very good principle, a fundamental principle, in my opinion, even though it is uh, included in a guidebook about electronic evidence, but it says that a report or other documentation of all the procedures that have been used uh, have to be stored, uh, and uh, an independent third party must have the opportunity to uh, verify these processes and achieve the same result. So we must be able to verify something. Uh, if an expert has submitted evidence, there must be a way how this can be examined and verified. In the criminal procedure law, uh, there is a section which says that evidence must be verified. Criminal procedure law in Latvia um, has the following provisions. Mr. Stukans already mentioned them in his presentation. According to the existing leg legislation, only the prosecution uh, can uh, commission expertise, and other expertise is impossible according to our law. The criminal procedure law does not envisage the right for the defense to ask for its own expertise. No, our legislation does not provide for that. It doesn't provide for um, uh, the attorney's expertise. There is the main expertise and additional expertise. So no expertise upon uh, defense lawyer's request. If we want to... Uh, enjoy the rights provided for by the con convention, then uh, the defense wants to receive additional expertise. What can we do? The first thing we can do is uh, search for a specialist on our own, and we do that. Let's start with the pluses. If we search for a specialist ourselves, we can choose the expert. Uh, we can uh, weigh his qualifications, uh, verify, and we will file, receive some kind of a report, uh, whether we like it or not, but we will get it, minus. Uh, the court, however, gives lesser weight uh, to our experts than uh, their expertise. Mr. Stukans said there are some additional expertises which uh, cannot be called expertise uh, in legal terms. They have no significance. And uh, another minus that uh, 
I must mention is that uh, very often uh, we can only provide documents, paper, but not uh, materials, uh, material evidence. Very rarely can we do so. The third way, which is accepted by everyone, the court can commission expertise, so the experts will have all the data required, uh, submitted, and the report will have a larger weight because it will be a legally assigned expert. But the minus is uh, this kind of expertise may not be uh, commissioned or as there may be some arguments used, uh, grounded or ungrounded, it's hard to predict, but uh, there will be arguments against it. Further on, there is a limited uh, choice of experts available according to the interpretation of the Convention and the practice of the European Court of Human Rights. The defense lawyer could f choose his own expert, an independent one. But if we um, uh, use a court um, in the criminal proceedings, then according to the procedure, uh, the defense lawyer and the prosecutor express their opinion, but the court may have its third opinion, which doesn't have to comply with either one. The importance of a consultant's opinion in the criminal proceedings. There's a decision of uh, the Supreme Court from uh, 2006. It's a case that was very criticized by uh, Mr. Stukans, who has spoken earlier. Uh, he believes uh, that uh, the stance of the Supreme Court should change. Well, I hope it won't, because uh, this would rob us of a great opportunity. Uh, right now, uh, this uh, decision of the Supreme Court from 2006 provides us with the only tool for uh, the attorney to uh, dispel doubts or, uh, about a specific uh, forensic expert's opinion or to create doubts. So uh, this uh, is a sort of foundation when the attorney does not just say to the court, I don't agree, but they bring in another consultancy opinion that creates a foundation for the further reasoning of the attorney. And if we won't have this decision of the Supreme Court to rely on, we won't have any tools for that. What are other opportunities when uh, the forensic um, examination, forensic expertise is not available to us, when it's not possible? What shall we do then? That is a great question because uh, um, sometimes uh, the forensic expertise becomes impossible because uh, there's no material. So all the samples have been used up or they are polluted and uh, no longer fit to be used and so on. Or uh, there is uh, no source data. There is insufficient material. And... Uh, De facto, um, the court might agree to an additional forensic expertise, but too much time has passed, or uh, the court believes that uh, we'll arrive at the same conclusion, or the court agrees with our reasoning for a supplementary um, forensic examination, but the court thinks that we won't find anything anyway. However, I think that uh, we need to use up all the opportunities at our disposal because uh, even definitely finding out that we are unable to answer certain questions is a step forward because this is an answer that we'll still be able to use uh, to keep going and uh, to put uh, the first um, report of the forensic expert in context. Let's uh, look at a situation from real life, or a string of situations, rather. I'll uh, try to touch upon a wide range of subjects, like phone records and other interesting things. So the first example is about phone records. How do we perform um, forensic examination of um, recordings of telephone conversations? Here we have a list uh, for uh, software and uh, other technical means that need to be used during the forensic procedure. P 
pay attention to um, paragraph 8. That's a um, classified um, software uh, that confirms to SAB mobile control standards. So what uh, are the sources for the expert's opinion? They refer to uh, the files provided by SAB. SAB is um, the Latvian um, Constitutional Security Bureau. Uh, they use these files. They determine their veracity. They use the special top secret classified software from the Constitutional Security Bureau to figure out that these records are not tampered with. And um, they perform additional operations. And there is a, this kind of disclaimer uh, that I see being copy-pasted from case to case. What are the key points in this disclaimer I'm showing you at the slide? All the aforementioned things are grounds to conclude that this record has not been tampered with. And uh, I have a question. If we have such a um, mysterious classified software that um, allows you to decide whether the record has been tampered with or not, how do we treat this classified software? Because if it's classified, we cannot figure out how it works. We cannot see it. We cannot touch it. Uh, the forensic expert cannot share what they did with this classified software. How can we believe this mystery? So I think that at least the judge should um, uh, have access to this um, classified software from uh, SAB. Uh, Constitutional Security Bureau, so that we can have at least some proof uh, that this really works. Otherwise, we just need to believe the words of an expert um, that they have used some mysterious, unseen of, unheard of uh, classified software. Another example about radio microphones. That's a real example. Uh, regarding records made by Latvian Economic Police. They had two files in WAV format, but uh, the files were of different length. One was a mono file, the other was a stereo file, and um, they were practically um, synchronized records of the same event. The experts compared uh, the two records, they figured out which bits were synchronized. They indicated that there are two lengths of uh, the record, and um, uh, they, uh, desp uh, despite the length, they conclude that uh, these records uh, were made uh, simultaneously and are untampered with. I begin to get questions. Does this mean that there were two radio microphones and two recording devices? Or there was one radio microphone and two um, recording devices? One of them worked in mono, the other in stereo. Third question, maybe the record was not made with a radio microphone but with something else. Fourth question, maybe this was one record and then it was um, tampered with, um, it uh, was processed and then re-recorded. A lot of questions. Now, a third example with the polygraph. I took a um, um, case from 2010, um, psychodiagnostic expertise uh, performed by the security police. During uh, the evaluation, um, there were critical questions, um, including control questions and neutral questions and uh, stimulating questions. So two groups of questions, one of them with two subgroups. What was the conclusion of the expert? By performing a polygram research, they figure out that the physiological processes of the person um, during the questioning 
gave such psychophysiological reactions that testified that um, they have uh, certain responses. But we only had this opinion. There was no polygram, so we could not just take a sheet of paper and point out at waves on the polygram and uh, ask what does this mean, what does that mean. There was no video recording of the expertise, you know, something like this was completely absent. And if we don't have a video recording of um, the interrogation under polygraph, then uh, uh, the court has uh, no right or reason to use such an expert opinion on the polygraph because you cannot verify what happened there. Because um, referring to the practice uh, of the Senate of uh, the Supreme Court, the expert opinion needs to be verifiable. In my opinion, right now polygraph uh, examinations in Latvia have uh, begun approaching shamanism. So this is something that happens somehow, cannot be verified, and we just need to believe uh, mysterious polygraph experts really curious. Now, a few issues that I see. Criminal pr Procedure Law, uh, Section 412, finishing pretrial actions in criminal process and passing uh, the case to court. There we see clearly that um, uh, there are no copies of um, forensic examinations of any kind, whether this is uh, psychiatry, psychology, um, forensic medicine. But there's an opportunity to become familiarized with the text, but you cannot get a copy. What can you copy? There are some things. You can copy the name of the expert, the questions, and uh, supplementary circumstances. But the defendant or their representative, they cannot get um, the copy of um, that part of uh, uh, the forensic experts report, um, which would list uh, the persons who were present during the forensic procedure, which would list uh, the materials of the case used during the examination and the source data of uh, the objects that were under examination. Um, I cannot even copy the methodology and the results. I don't have this right as an attorney. And uh, this is uh, extremely limiting. I think that this violates uh, the stance of the European Court of Human Rights, which outlines the equality of arms. When one party cannot uh, be placed um, in a disadvantageous position rega uh, in regards to the opponent, I see a discrepancy here with the norms of the European uh, Court of Human Rights, indeed. Because uh, this robs me of opportunity to at least take this piece of paper and show it to an independent expert so that I, as an attorney, can know what is written there and whether this is right. Uh, now, another example. Uh, forensic expertise with the uh, electrical shock procedure. With the it is not uh, used uh, frequently, but uh, there is an interesting case where a person uh, who was a defendant uh, and before she uh, came to the court uh, hearing, uh, she uh, turned to the police with an application that uh, uh, the other party has uh, used electric shock against her. And the expertise found that uh, uh, the thermal burns uh, uh, have been uh, found uh, on the body, which could have been the result of an attack with an electric shock device. And uh, the uh, victim had been examined. Uh, the uh, expert uh, decision was made uh, based on uh, the uh, call, the card, uh, the record card from the ambulance. After <coughs> the emergency, ambulance was called, and uh, they found that uh, uh, the victim has uh, 
uh, the uh, burn. Uh, the, subsequently, in the hospital, uh, the doctor had found uh, a burn, second degree burn, and uh, the third document <coughs> was also uh, the uh, report from the uh, uh, blood test, which uh, f had found that uh, the um, perpetrator had 2.1 uh, promils of alcohol in his blood. These are the documents which uh, were used as evidence to prove that uh, the uh, victim had suffered electric shock. And uh, according to the law, the expert's report has to be scientifically founded. The law requires this. But in th that case, in question, the expert's report uh, was not scientifically <coughs> justified or argumented, and it was uh, uh, not sufficiently proven that uh, the burn had been caused by electric shock. The individual himself could have caused himself bodily harm in order to compromise uh, the uh, most important uh, witness. We can see that uh, uh, wounds from electric shock device could be var various, uh, very different. This is a, a thermal uh, burn which may not be connected uh, in any way to electric shock. And then the question is why uh, and how experts could uh, make this conclusion. And the last example, two minutes if you permit me. This case was reviewed in court recently. A um, uh, body of a young woman, uh, a naked body was found, and the um, defendant uh, appeared and confessed a few days later. Uh, he told the police that uh, uh, they had a conflict with the woman uh, and uh, he had killed her and uh, ran away at first and a few days later decided to confess and to report to the police himself. Uh, on the crime scene, uh, the woman's uh, lingerie was uh, found, the so-called leggings uh, with uh, a tear in the front, the same uh, form of tear was uh, on the knickers, and there were blood stains on the underwear. S subsequently, a man's underwear was found, also covered with blood stains. And uh, the, in the preliminary investigations, this evidence was not uh, um, investigated, <coughs> uh, verified. Uh, the investigator um, um, they believed in uh, the uh, testimony of uh, the defendant who said that they had an argument, uh, a domestic conflict, uh, uh, but uh, the um, parents of the victim believed that sexual abuse in a group has been taken place, and they tried to um, achieve uh, an expertise uh, which would uh, uh, find the uh, cause of uh, uh, damage to the clothing, whether they are torn or uh, cut by some object uh, which could uh, be used as evidence. Uh, then with regard to the bloodstains uh, from where uh, or the source of these uh, uh, stains uh, uh, had to be uh, explained, whether it is the woman's blood or the uh, owner's blood or maybe some of his buddies. Uh, had left their blood stains on this underwear. And subsequently, I would like to refer to uh, the uh, European Court of Human Rights and the uh, section about uh, uh, the investigation process as it should be. And uh, when I heard uh, um, Ms. Sheridan's presentation about how uh, the uh, investigation should be uh, organized. Uh, this was not the case in the uh, examples that I have mentioned. And perhaps this doesn't concern the experts, but more investigators on the crime scene. It is a bit uh, strange to see 
that uh, just formal photographs are taken on the crime scene just to establish the facts, but not to establish evidence, not to document evidence. The best example is uh, a color photo, but I have seen cases where uh, black and white photographs are uh, placed, and then when a defense lawyer are given uh, photocopies of the case materials, then uh, he only gets blurs, uh, blurred uh, um, uh, photographs without any details in them, <clears throat> and uh, the defense uh, could be provided with original photographs. Uh, we um, managed to obtain a photograph uh, where uh, we can uh, f see uh, which were some things that uh, we uh, couldn't see without uh, enlarging the photograph, that there are marks from the fabric which can be a proof to how long uh, the person has spent uh, lying in this position. And uh, there was a mark uh, on uh, maybe on the same spot uh, where the underwear uh, was uh, damaged uh, that the uh, perpetrators have used uh, some sharp object uh, to tear a hole. Uh, here on the hand, uh, we can see a mark uh, which shows where the person has been lying for a long time. So that uh, raises question whether the body was uh, lying on a different, on some other surface. So uh, why should experts' uh, reports be verified? Because uh, experts may be lacking something, qualifications, knowledge, experience. It is very possible. Irresponsible attitude to experts' work may be the case, or human error. Simply, an expert wants to do his best but uh, makes a mistake, doesn't see some information in the data. And sometimes uh, there is uh, corruption involved uh, that uh, the expert uh, chooses not to see something. Uh, in fact, uh, an expert's report must be such that it can be verified by any third party, particularly the court. And we must uh, eliminate the situation that only because the expert is a state institution, the expert's report uh, is uh, viewed as 100% credible. The, there is literature where you can find these uh, conclusions and advice. Uh, you, these are internet resources. You can all find them. And thank you for your attention. Thank you, Salvedi. I would like to announce the next uh, speaker, Gabriele Jotkaita Granskiene. Gabriele has been work has been working in the forensic expertise uh, as the manager of uh, a bureau of forensic expertise. Presently, she is a judge in the Supreme Court, so she will provide the perspective of an expert and a judge as well as a lecturer. As for a long time, she has also been a lecturer in the university. Gabriela, you are welcome. Uh, the presentation is on the topic of how we value uh, the conclusions of forensic experts. First of all, I would like to thank uh, organizers for inviting me here to share some views about such important evidence as forensic evidence. Um, uh, previous speakers already uh, um, uh, told us about different aspects of forensic evidence in the court, but nevertheless, I would like to introduce some other aspects or to argue with my previous colleague, uh, Tony, because um, uh, some things are uh, solved differently in the different levels. So how, for, uh, how forensic conclusions, uh, what value have forensic uh, conclusions uh, for judgment? And I should say not, not only for judgment, but for all criminal procedure. And uh, the usual, uh, the usual uh, understanding is that forensic uh, uh, conclusions are usual evidence of the case. 
but we can found two more aspects. Uh, uh, the broader one, uh, not only for evaluation of re reliability of other <coughs> evidences gathered, but also as a guarantee to a fair trial, uh, as uh, was mentioned earlier. And uh, the third one is a factor influencing inner conviction of a judge. The short, uh, the short uh, reminder for you that we have different definitions of forensic science, but it is two features, the main features, application of science of special knowledge in uh, uh, criminal procedure or civil procedure or administrative procedure. Why I am talking about this? Because uh, we have the term special knowledge, the competencies of forensic experts. And for example, several years ago in Lithuania was um, uh, a lot of discussions if legal uh, sphere, legal knowledge can be uh, the scope uh, of forensic science. And now uh, we, it is, uh, I will show you later the European recommendation that legal knowledge is not uh, the sphere for forensic conclusion, except the only one exception is made if uh, the court should apply foreign uh, laws. So in such case, the forensic conclusion on application on uh, foreign laws can be presented. And uh, why I am talking about this, because uh, uh, these features leads us that uh, forensic science is regulated by two uh, main regulations, by legal uh, principles and by uh, peculiarities of science. And uh, the main, uh, uh, the main um, purpose of prosecutors, uh, judges, is to determine if these regulations are not violated. If we can manage uh, the regulations, uh, legal regulations, we have uh, a little bit problems with the determination of how scientific regulations uh, are managed. And the forensic community have put a lot of efforts to make this procedure for courts and prosecutors easier because uh, we have, um, uh, we have quality management systems in most forensic laboratories, which assure that all uh, operational procedures applied, methods applied are verified and validated for the tasks uh, that uh, are solved. And also, for example, as we were told in uh, Maya's presentation, uh, in Latvia you have register of forensic methods that are applied for, uh, uh, for different types of forensic examination. So, uh, these efforts are made, but uh, the importance of forensic evidence are already uh, acknowledged by European level, and we have the main, uh, the main document, this is guidelines on the role of court-appointed experts in judicial proceedings, but nevertheless, uh, it is defined in these uh, guidelines that uh, this is minimum standard that should be applied in all European countries. Uh, and um, uh, from uh, this point of view and uh, from legal, uh, legal principles, what are the role of a judge or prosecutor in the all procedure of ordering forensic examination and performance of forensic examination and evaluating the results? Um, it is the crucial role because from the decisions of prosecutors and courts, sometimes the results of, of forensic examinations depends because if, for, for example, investigative material is of bad quality, the forensic conclusion um, means nothing for the court. So. Um, uh, the discretion of court is to define the necessity for forensic examination, including uh, selection of type of forensic examination, preparation of tasks, selection of experts, and co coordination of performance of examination if it is necessary. And, uh, 
Uh, if we are talking about ordering of forensic examination, for example, in criminal procedure code of Lithuania, we have no obligatory, <coughs> obligatory forensic, examin uh, forensic examination. But nevertheless, Supreme Court of Lithuania uh, decided several times um, uh, that, uh, first of all, it is decision of court how to act in the cases where is imaginary or needful forensic examination. And uh, the second uh, principle is that, uh, that the court uh, decided that criminal procedure does not require in every case to use all possible means of evidences, including forensic examination. So if uh, the court refuses to order forensic examination, we should uh, determine if this was uh, legally based. And uh, in Lithuania, we have several cases of uh, compulsory examination on de facto basis. Uh, this is also uh, rulings of court, uh, and it uh, defines that the results of false bookkeeping are determined by records of uh, special bodies or forensic conc conclusion. Another one is um, incorrigible disfigurement of victim body, and uh, this fact can only be determined by uh, forensic medicine examination, and uh, it is defined clearly that uh, for determination of said circumstances, the certificate of anaplastic specialist is not enough. So we have to have more deep examination in that, and also the determination of criterions of heart incurable illness is uh, question for medicine uh, examination not legal. And that's all. All other uh, cases for ordering or refusing to order uh, or forensic examination uh, is discretion of uh, uh, court. And um, uh, also, uh, the discretion of court is to prepare the, um, to formulate the questions for um, forensic examination. And uh, for example, we have decision that uh, the uh, Supreme Court decided that proposition of claimant that the courts without legal basis refused some questions of them was uh, uh, legally unbased because uh, these questions were are not related to uh, case material or so on. And also they were beyond the limits of special knowledge. Uh, uh, but nevertheless, the court decides that, um, uh, that all parties should have the right to react to the questions proposed by opposite party of the case, and if such proce procedure is sustained, there are no basis for occurrence of breach of rights of case participants. The same is uh, uh, de uh, defined or stated in uh, jurisprudence of Euro uh, European Court of Human Rights, uh, where we can uh, uh, we can find that the uh, refusal of request for forensic examination itself does not violate ruling of convention if they, if they are duly uh, duly argumented. And in this case, court acknowledged. I am, oi. Um, court acknowledged that the applicant's request for an addition, sp uh, additional special opi uh, opinion appeared to have been based on their disagreement with the conclusions of the previous opinion rather than on any shortcomings therein. So we can decide from this that uh, the additional uh, examination can be ordered if there are some shortcomings, not in uh, every case. Another, uh, another uh, decisions of European Court uh, says that uh, nevertheless violations exist and uh, it is decided that ordering uh, the same case as uh, showed the previous lecturer, the Khodorkovsky and Lebedev. Uh, in this case, uh, uh, defense, witness, defense uh, uh, attorney pre uh, wanted to present first of all uh, 
independent or uh, additional examination, which was rejected uh, uh, by the court. And uh, also the court re rejected uh, um, plea uh, of the defense to question uh, the expert witnesses, uh, these experts who performed previous forensic examination. And such case already was treated as a breach of equality of arms. Another case also defines uh, uh, the same that uh, the equality of arms should be uh, should be treated and it can be in both ways treated, questioning of an expert or uh, uh, including into the case, evaluating of uh, secondary conclusions. Uh, uh, the same is in Lithuanian uh, court practices, uh, and for example, uh, during appeal investigation, a convicted person asked for psychological and psychiatric examination to determine her emotional state, and the appeal court refused to order said examination, and Supreme Court decided that such motivation uh, was not appropriate. Uh, for the reasoning uh, for which examination was asked, because um, to determine existence of psychological affect, it is necessary to determine person's psychological, uh, uh, I don't know the word, psychological uh, position at a moment of the crime, not previous illnesses or so on. The same is with ordering uh, additional and secondary examination. The necessity should be defined and uh, reasoned that this investi investigation is necessary. So returning to European minimum standards on appointment of forensic experts, uh, we can see the main selection criteria of an expert. I will go very shortly through them and emphasize some uh, crucial um, elements. So uh, the most important, uh, not the most important, but uh, important is that, that only natural person can be an expert, one person or a commission of uh, persons. And there we have the difference from Lithuania and criminal procedure code and um uh, and uh, I think uh, with Latvian criminal procedure code because uh, in this CPA guidelines it is de determined that uh, if the uh, examination is performed by commission of an expert, uh, it should be clearly uh, defined uh, what job was performed by concrete expert. For example, in Lithuania, there are no such uh, so, uh, such uh, requirement. And also, the general principle is qualification and competences uh, of an expert. And also, we have a big problem here, because sometimes uh, judges can or um, evaluate wrongly the, uh, the possibilities of the persons according to their licenses. I'm talking mostly about construction examination because we have very large number of licenses in construction examination and sometimes they are very narrow but uh, the expert uh, uh, solves tax tasks very broad. So uh, therefore we have a lot of uh, problems with evaluation of qualification and competence of forensic expert. Uh, and uh, as I said, foreign law uh, may be uh, the object of forensic examination. And uh, uh, what about independence and impartiality? The main principle is that the expert has to remain independent concerning the matter and uh, impartial concerning the relationship with both parties. You understand that these requirements are the same as uh, requirements for judges and prosecutors. Uh, and uh, for example, we have very uh, interesting cases in uh, this situation. So we are independence and impartiality of forensic experts we, uh, we are questioned. For example, in the case of Lithuanian railways, it was civil case and uh, the 
uh, expert, uh, there was a formed commission of an expert, and uh, one of these uh, experts was a frequent work supervisor and foreman of defendant uh, of Lithuanian railways, and uh, moreover, the translation of the uh, examination was uh, made previous uh, of uh, its signature. So it was decided that this is not good, especially that this person was a uh, frequent worker and supervisor of uh, this, uh, uh, this institution and uh, more. Uh, in the same case, as I mentioned, it was commission of an experts and uh, the commission issued one, uh, one uh, uh, conclusion, and there were no uh, uh, clear definition what works was performed by separate experts, and therefore all, conclu uh, all conclusion was denied and refused by the court. Now, time and technical capacity, I will not stop on these things. Uh, if uh, it, is, it is interesting to you, uh, you can ask for uh, this presentation, but nevertheless, predictable cost, for example, in Lithuania, if we want to order examination from private uh, expert, uh, the uh, state institution uh, should ask for lowest hourly rate, and uh, these guidelines say <coughs> that average our late average cost uh, of an expert uh, should be taken as valid selection criteria. Uh, guidelines say that uh, language and nat nationality doesn't matter in these cases, and this is the answer from the first part of the conference that, for example, our Forensic Science Center performed several forensic examinations for Georgia, for Latvia, and for uh, other countries, and uh, also these practices are applied in NFC, uh, so there are no such uh, obstacles as language or nationality for performance of uh, forensic examination. Uh, this I said already, and uh, uh, from this short introduction to the legal regulation and court practices, we can see that uh, uh, there are high requirements for independence, impartiality, competences of an expert, uh, special procedures of pe performance of examination, and. Um, uh, and it's, uh, it impress us that uh, this evidence are better or more credible in, uh, in uh, criminal cases. But uh, nevertheless, all the courts from international to national courts uh, strictly say that uh, these results should be evaluated under general principles of uh, all evidence evaluation. Uh, this is rebel Admissibility and reliability. Nevertheless, there are some peculiarities, and also by uh, uh, by uh, during the determination of value of forensic conclu conclusion, the judge or prosecutor also should take into account the investigative material, the uh, initial data, truth, uh, truthfulness of initial data received, methods applied, uh, thorough, uh, thoroughness of examination, and so on. And so I will present you now some examples from our practices of of civil, uh, civil division of uh, Supreme Court of Lithuania, and uh, uh, it uh, defined that forensic conclusions of part of it can be rejected if uh, the content and form of forensic examination does not comply with the legal requirements, the content is contradictory and vague, the expert's conclusion does not follow the results of the investigation, the conclusion was provided uh, regarding the questions that are not important for the case. Um, also, uh, there is a reasonable doubt about the process and results of an expert and is a, an examination, inadequate forensic methods was used, and so on. Uh, 
Uh, and uh, also, it is interesting for you, maybe, <laughs> will be to see that um, uh, civil courts said, uh, civil division of Supreme Courts uh, such, made such uh, conclusions that if we have categorical answer, uh, then this, uh, this is direct proof. If we have probabilistic answer, this is an indirect proof, but if it is um, uh, supported by evidences gathered in the case, then uh, everything is uh, okay. And uh, 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 when uh, not leaning of forensic conclusion uh, leads or not leads to violation of Convention of Human Rights. And uh, there we also have very clear uh, 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 definition that uh, the conclusion of an expert are only ever an informed opinion and not an ab absolute scientific truth. And the court has already found that statements made by psychiatric experts uh, uh, at an as this court trial form only one part of the evidence submitted to the jury. And um, uh, so uh, it is uh, defined that uh, uh, forensic evidence should be evaluated together with all the material gathered. Uh, so, if we are talking about another aspect of value of forensic examination as warranty to right to a fair trial or uh, evaluation of reliability of other uh, evidences gathered, for example, testimonies of full number of witnesses. So, as um, a guarantee of the right to a fair trial, uh, so we, uh, these uh, statements uh, comes uh, from our regulation, legal regulation or Supreme Court, uh, court practices, and uh, they indicate that um, uh, as a right to a fair trial, forensic examination can be uh, treated uh, as a procedural imperative to determine the essential legally uh, significant circumstances of uh, the case uh, the, uh, as a condition of fair and proper hearing. Also, um, uh, it was defined uh, by the Su uh, Su Supreme Court uh, uh, that uh, the appeal court made a mistake not ordering forensic examination and uh, because they gave priority to the principles of process concentration and deficiency, not to process comprehensivity, did not uh, comply with proper investigation of dispute between parties, did not follow principle of cooperation and uh, vi violated the rights to a fair trial. Uh, also, uh, it, uh, it is the, the main essence uh, that uh, uh, all the evidences uh, should be added to the case and should be seen by all uh, case parties. And in this uh, aspect, we also had uh, the case when uh, expert, private expert made examination from person's health history, but this uh, health history was not added uh, to the case, uh, to the materials of cases, and uh, therefore it was determined uh, and uh, acknowledged as essential right of a party uh, to get all uh, information and to see all the evidence of this, uh, what is um, uh, witness testimony is uh, easy. And now I would like to answer for a question and, uh, about polygraph examination, because uh, as we know that uh, uh, that uh, all the evidences are very valuable for inner conviction of a judgment, is no doubt, but if every type of uh, investigation is very uh, important. So uh, you can see a little bit his history that technical possibilities exist about uh, 100 years. Uh, in Lithuania, it is used uh, only for limited goals, for example, for selection of person for a special job. Uh, as investigation, uh, polygraph examination 
is uh, uh, performed since 2011 in police laboratory. Uh, and we can found that in science, uh, in science, in scientific doctrine, it has dual position. No, uh, and yes, with limitations. Crimin our Lithuanian criminalist also has dual position. Yes, and no, because of applied methodology. And uh, court practices under formation, nevertheless, we have one decision of uh, Supreme Administrative uh, Court, which says that in a dis uh, in a uh, that neg neg negative conclusions of polygraph examination may be evaluated as additional information negatively describing the person and his hair environment. But uh, our Supreme Court and uh, the most cost of uh, foreign uh, countries said no. And uh, it is categorical position because uh, the purpose of polygraph examination is not to uh, approve or deny the uh, elements or circumstances of, of a case, but only to determine the psychological uh, psychological uh, not um, acts, uh, uh, psychological phys physiological acts of the person. So thank you for my for the <laughs> for your attention. Uh, the presentation which we are going to hear from Katrin will be very useful for the judges who ask questions about uh, experts who are not in the, on the list of uh, the register of uh, forensic experts. So let me introduce Katrin Zeidel. Um, doctor of law, um, Catherine is uh, responsible uh, of uh, issues of uh, forensic experts and communication of uh, of his uh, forensic experts. And Catherine also uh, takes part uh, uh, in uh, training of uh, judges, particularly on uh, I issues related to. Um, forensic experts. She is very knowledgeable on uh, these uh, uh, issues, particularly from uh, the uh, point of view of law. So Catherine uh, Seidel's presentations, the involvement and significance of court experts in German civil law. First of all, thank you for inviting me. It's a big honor to be here. And uh, yeah, one thing I can say, uh, I'm pleased that some judges are here and are still here because usually I'm used to uh, talk to experts and judges and lawyers are always invited, but they never come. So um, I'm happy to see so many of you here. And uh, so let's start. Um, yeah, maybe from, to my introduction, I am presiding judge in um, a chamber for construction law. So I have to do with civil construction law. That's everything from building autobahn, uh, something goes wrong uh, all the time, building autobahns. And, uh, but we also have small houses and it's always about money, not about uh, dead people or crimes, but uh, um, yeah, it's not as uh, exciting as crime, uh, criminal law, but uh, I hope that you, can, uh, you will still follow my uh, presentation. So my presentation is about the role of court experts in German law, especially German civil law, and about the way judges in Germany work with court experts in the court proceedings and about the way we ensure the competence and reliability of court experts. Last but not least, I would like to share with you some ideas and some projects on how communication and cooperation with court experts could be improved for everybody, for court experts, lawyers, and judges. So first of all, about the role of court experts in German law. A court expert is one possibility of evidence in a civil law case. 
Other possibilities, we have heard that today, um, include the hearing of witnesses or parties, documents, and judicial inspection. So we look at the things ourselves. We can go out and look at, uh, at uh, crime scenes as well if we want to, but we never do. So that's what sometimes the experts have to do for us as well. The judges um, decide whether or not to have an expert, and only the court experts are the, um, the real evidence in court. A private expert is brought in by the parties, and he's not considered as evidence. He's uh, considered to be a part of uh, what the parties take to the court. It's like they tell us something when they bring an expert to court. So only the experts that we <coughs> And choose and that come to the court for us, those are the court experts. The court experts in Germany are um, often referred to as the judge's assistants. This reflects their significance and position quite well, although it's not supposed to mean that they help us uh, solve the legal side of a case. That, of course, not, but it reflects their significance still, I think. Because the court experts, they help us to find and analyze the factual basis of a case. They complete our knowledge on the technical side of the case, on medical side of the case, or whatever side the judges have no idea of. Since they are impartial and they are specialized in their area, their report is much more convincing than the statement of a witness, even an eyewitness or a party. Let me tell you why. The witness sometimes has to testify after a long period of time has passed from the event in question. And the human memory sometimes is an evil betrayer. There have been studies that showed that witnesses, even those intending to say nothing but the truth, perceive and remember an identical situation differently, depending on their social backgrounds, relationships, sympathies, and beliefs. So the same situation can be described by different witnesses in completely different ways, and none of the witnesses is actually lying. If you ask a German judge, we will say a witness is the most uncertain, most unreliable evidence of all. The court experts, on the other hand, they can't give us information on, for example, whether or not a person did or said something. They haven't been there when it happened but they can uh, analyze the facts and which conclusion to draw from them. They can verify the statements of parties and witnesses and a lot of times prove them wrong as well. So, I have brought you a case. I have forgotten to press this, but I have brought you a case. This is a case, it's not an original photo, I have just looked up um, a photo that could resemble this case. It was a case I had on my table. Uh, it was a car accident that happened on the German autobahn in heavy traffic and three cars bumped into each other. The plaintiff, who was in car number two, so in the middle, he claimed that after he had managed to stop his car behind car number one, with an emergency braking action, that's what he told us, the defendant who drove the car number three had bumped into him and pushed his car onto car number two. So the plaintiff wanted money for both the damages in his back and in his front. So in Germany, we have a saying, maybe it's the, my translation might be bad, but we say when it bangs in the back, money comes to the front. That's the rule in Germany, and uh, usually that is true, but it can be different in a multiple collision uh, just like this. I had witnesses, of course, that didn't help at all. The witness in car number two, that was the plaintiff's car in the middle, he stated that he was 100% sure that the car had come to a stop when the defendant's car crashed into them and pushed them forward onto car number one. He uh, told a very nice story, like uh, it happened like in slow motion, and I remember how glad I was when I stood, and then I saw him coming from behind in the rear mirror, and uh, I thought this and that, and I said, okay, it made sa makes sense. And then I thought maybe he uh, tells the truth, because the defendant from car number three, 
He said he was not sure anymore it was so long ago and not all went too fast uh, also. So I was hoping to find out with a court expert what happened. And I had a court expert analyze the damages on car one and two, so the first two cars. And just from the damages, he could tell in the end that the reason for all trouble was in fact car number two. So the expert said uh, it was impossible that car number two was standing when car number three bumped into it. Impossible, he said. So we, he was 100% sure on the scale between zero and 100. Um, so um, I saw completely clear after the expert statement, and I was very glad, and there was nobody discussing anymore, and nobody saying, but I was right because. And in this case, there was no money coming to the, uh, to the car number two, uh, at least not for the damages in his front area. Without an expert, I wouldn't have had a chance to find out what had really had happened. And in this case, also, the expert uh, could tell whose statement was right and whose wasn't. But that does not necessarily mean, as I said before, that the plaintiff or the witness was lying. It just means that the humans are fallible and memory can be deceptive for various reasons, whereas the facts that an expert can analyze will not fail even years later. That's very impressive, and by that you can also see that I don't only have construction law cases, but also car accidents that sometimes can be a nice change in the daily practice. So um, how do we assess the experts' opinions? In more than 90% of the cases, we will follow the experts' report. That's what the statistics say. The decisions uh, are subject to the free appraisal of evidence. Um, the judge can ask the expert for an additional written report or an oral report in a court hearing. In construction law, um, we also always have additional questions for the expert. So the expert most of the time has to write uh, an additional um, report to answer questions, and in most cases, and it has proved that that is much easier, in most cases he has to come to the court and give an oral statement to end the case completely. Um, we can also ask um, additional court experts, but not for the same question if we find the first expert satisfactory, but if we have more um, areas uh, we need an expertise in, we can ask uh, more or, or um, different experts for that, but they, own also, they always have to be responsible for their own question. We can't have a team of experts work on one question together. We always have to find, uh, to, to um, verify which experts said what to which question, so we can't mix that up, um, kind of. Um, if we don't follow an expert's report, um, we, oh, okay, yeah, that's what I wanted to say. If we can't, um, if we can't find, um, uh, if we are not convinced by the expert's report, we can uh, always choose a new expert and say, okay, this one doesn't, doesn't work. It, uh, it, wasn't, uh, it wasn't helpful. We just need a new expert to answer the question. We are allowed to do that in any way. If we don't follow the uh, expert's report, we will have to state in the judgment why. And that doesn't happen very often, but uh, if we don't follow it, it, we will have a huge problem. We will maybe um, have uh, something else in the evidence that proves the uh, court expert wrong, but in most cases we would be forced to, um, to get another expert to verify what really happened. So if we don't follow, we have to state why. And if we do follow the expert, we also have to say in, in the judgment why this uh, expert's uh, report was so convincing. We, uh, we are not allowed to just say that was a convincing report and we follow it. Uh, we sometimes have private experts as well who the parties engage to um, yeah, to attack the court expert. In fact, we must say that often leads to conflicts. And in the case we have 
uh, a court expert and the private expert, and they don't agree, we have to weigh why we follow, why we not follow uh, the court expert, and we have to um, give reasons for that. Um, the Supreme Court had to remind us a lot of times that we can't just follow the court expert's report. That's um, very, very important for us that we, um, that we see the private experts as well and that we, we weigh their arguments very carefully. So um, if the uh, expert cannot answer the question of the court with a categorical yes or no, we have had that a few times today already, then the expert's report is still of a very high significance. For example, a handwriting analysis needed to find out uh, whether, to, whether or not the defendant signed uh, a contract or a promissory note. That will only, in very few cases, will be 100%. We have learned today why that is so. And um, most of the time, it will be very likely, rather unlikely, or something even in the middle. Um, in these cases, we have to carefully weigh all the evidences we have, like witnesses. We have to find out, was he, was he there at all to, to make the signature? Uh, did somebody see how he signed it or not? All these questions we have to uh, look at as well, and we have to weigh all these things as well. We need to come to a conviction. That's what the Supreme Courts say. I'm, I hope the translation is not too funny. But the Supreme Court says we have to come to a conviction that makes all reasonable doubts remain silent without completely eliminating them. So there are, we need to be um, convinced in a way that not too many serious doubts are speaking up anymore. But there may be doubts remaining, but they not too loud and not too serious, please. Then we can come to a conviction. So if we don't come to a conviction because we have too many doubts speaking up loud, then the, uh, we cannot be convinced of the factual basis and the party referring to that factual basis will lose the civil trial. That's how it goes in German civil law. We have uh, several challenges to deal with in uh, Germany in the civil law chamber. Um, of course, the first one is finding the right factual um, basis uh, and finding the right expert for that factual basis. Um, we have to decide which area of expertise to choose from. Sometimes we have a wide range to choose from for the same question. For example, if we have, uh, if you if want to found, find out about a person's mental health, we can ask a psychologist or a psychiatrist. Um, to find out the reason why somebody has a back pain, we can ask an orthopedist or a neurologist. It's our choice, and we are free in this choice. For damages in the house, my area, we can choose an architect who sees the big hole of everything, or we can choose a carpenter who's just in charge of smaller parts of the house. So these decisions that you have to take very early sometimes, they are really important as they lead uh, to expert statements that cannot be helpful sometimes and only cost time and money when you have to start all over again with another expert. So that's really important to be careful at this stage also. Taking care is worth it. Also, there are many, many traps in communication between judges and experts and also lawyers and experts, I must say, because if the expert doesn't know what to do, he cannot write a convincing report. And if the judge does not understand the report, he cannot, the right, uh, he cannot make the right judgment. That's the, well, that's, uh, it sounds simple, but in the small little steps in between, so many things go wrong, and I want to come back to that a little bit later. So in this, against this background, we have rules and proceedings in Germany to, uh, to ensure the quality and the reliability of experts and their work. First of all, we have, um, of course, associations and certifications for experts in many different fields, uh, but we also have an official way to ensure that, that there are experts that have been examined thoroughly on their outstanding competence, but also on their independence and personal reliability. 
um, these experts, they have to go through a really sometimes very tough procedure. A lot of uh, experts fail this procedure. And, but once they have passed, they are named publicly appointed and sworn experts. Um, the public appointment is regulated by law in uh, Germany and it aims to guarantee and name a pool of specially trustworthy and competent experts, not only for courts but also for the general public. So there's a list that also the public can, um, uh, can turn to whenever they need an expert and they have a guarantee that they get um, a good, trustworthy and competent expert. For us, uh, for the judges, the procedure law states that the publicly appointed and sworn experts have to be chosen by us um, if there's a field we have, um, the, we have publicly uh, appointed and sworn experts, not in, not in all the fields uh, that we want that uh, we have that system yet. We don't have the public, we, have, we don't have the system of, um, the system of the publicly appointed and sworn experts for medical experts, for example. Um, obviously, the, uh, the law thinks that doctors are especially trustworthy by nature or something like that. They don't have that system for them. So the public appointment of experts, um, the public appointment of experts um, takes place through an official act which awards the experts their, spe their special qualification and higher credibility. So an appointed and sworn expert will stand out from a group of experts. The procedure is ruled by law and this allows the provinces and Germany um, to transfer the competence to institutions such as the Chamber of Commerce, the Chamber of Crafts, the Chamber of Architects and Engineers, and the, chambers, uh, the Chamber of Agriculture. So these institutions, they have their own procedures again, and they follow their own procedures to make sure only the most outstanding and trustworthy applicants get to be publicly appointed and sworn in. This includes, um, this includes written applications stating also the financial situation. That's important for the independence and trustworthiness. You can trust someone who's really in need of money because there's always the danger he's not impartial anymore then. And of course, the professional and technical details um, of his knowledge must be presented as well. Um, there are tests and they have to hand in report samples as well, so it's really tough and at some of the chambers at least. Um, I have the honor to be part of the committee in the Chamber of Commerce and the Chamber of Architects and en Engineers uh, that propose the candidates for public appointment after looking through the applications. That's really interesting because I can see how much it takes um, to be an expert, to become an expert um, at all. It's really, really tough. It costs a lot of time and money and schooling also. For the architects and engineers, um, I am also one of three lecturers in a course that teaches the candidates the skills they need as an expert for courts. The other lecturers are an attorney and an experienced court expert. So we are a team and we teach people who want to become um, court experts together um, and tell them what they need, especially when they work for courts. At the end of that course, there's an examination and the applicants have to pass before they can become appointed, uh, publicly appointed and sworn in. The Chamber of Commerce and the other institutions have similar schoolings and lectures with examinations in the end, and through this they all make sure that the experts not only have outstanding specialist knowledge, but know what is expected from them when they work with courts. Um, they get an overview of the procedure law, which uh, really it's really always important to look what the other side needs as well, like we do, uh, we do it when we um, go to uh, schoolings for the experts as well. And they learn how to write a report for the, for the court and what to do and how to behave in a court hearing. That's not always so easy also. And uh, the conflict situations uh, that can arise when they are in a court hearing or communicating with uh, the lawyers during uh, the expertise. 
Um, once the experts are appointed and sworn in, they must apply for the prolongation of that every few years, and they have to prove that they still have the, the special qualification, the ability and trustworthiness, and that they have attended schoolings regularly. So it's uh, quite a lot of work to be um, a publicly appointed and sworn expert in Germany. Nevertheless, we have about 15,000 publicly appointed and sworn experts on many, many different fields. Uh, on some fields, there just is no uh, public appointment so far. Other than that, we have um, officially recognized experts on several fields dealing, for example, with the security of machines or products, and there are also public authorities like the Advisory Committee of Land Value or the State Bureau of Investigation that we can contact when we need an expert's report. As I said, we always need a person, not an institution um, or authority as an expert. It has to be a natural person. Um, the institutions and authorities, they can always name a natu natural person, of course, to give us the report and to be expert for us. Um, the judges in Germany, they are free in their decision which, which expert to entrust a case. We are completely free. We have to make sure, of course, that the expert has to be independent. If the parties agree on a certain expert, we have to engage that expert, though, if there are no heavy reasons uh, speaking against that. And, mm -hmm. Oh, okay, I'm hurrying up. In, um, in some fields, like my personal field of construction law, after a while we have a pool of experts uh, we choose from, and uh, we know how, who we want to work with and also who would work well uh, for certain cases, parties, or certain attorneys. Even we, sometimes we take care of that also. So when we need an expert in Germany, we often ask our colleagues if they know someone and that means that the judges are often, uh, that the experts are often chosen during coffee breaks or lunches. So that's um, a very effective way and experts should always keep in mind how, that the judges also talk to each other. The expert to, for the procedure law, the expert receives his order from the court and all further information as well. He's also paid by the court. Um, the expert's obligations are stated in the German proced uh, civil procedure law, the Zivil Prozessordnung, and um, the law states, for example, what the experts have to check when they receive the order from the court for a report. The experts have to check whether they are cap oops, uh, the expert uh, have to check whether they are capable of giving the report. Uh, they also have to have an eye on the costs uh, of the report, including all the actions necessary to get there, like uh, laboratories and all the costs that, that can arise. Um, they have to watch the deadlines, communicate with the court whenever an obstacle occurs, and um, they have to keep contact with us. The fee for experts is also regulated by law. The expert is paid by the hour. The hour, hourly fee is depending on the field he's working on. And you may say that the more scientific the area an expert is working in is, the higher the fee will be. The hourly fee is mostly much lower than what an expert can ask when he's not working for courts, and this has been criticized a lot by um, the experts' associations. On the bright side, I can say working for courts means security, and the liability for mistakes is also very limited by law for court experts. So, in uh, Germany, judges as well as experts in the last few years have worked on the improvement of communication on cooperation quite a lot. Um, the beginning of this was a survey to find out why the court cases in which experts were involved were always taking so long. Um, we could not work on every reason for the duration, as many reasons have to do with court requirements and attorneys, of course, I must say as a judge. But it was also found out that a lot is not going well as far as expectations on both sides, communication and cooperation are concerned. After the survey, we founded a quality circle. 
The quality circle consists of judges, experts, members of the different chambers for public appointment and also attorneys. We are, um, we are working um, on finding better ways to communicate and make cooperation smoother. For example, it was found out in the survey that many experts find the formulation of their order and other court letters, often standard letters made by computers, unclear or missing the actual point. So the, co so the co consequence was that the quality circle together designed new standard letters, new forms, and clearer wording that is now used by the courts in Germany. The survey also revealed that the experts wanted some kind of feedback on whether or not their reports were followed by the court. This resulted in a feedback sheet that judges now can use to let the expert know if his report was helpful or if his behavior in a hearing was adequate or not. The survey also revealed that many judges fear contact with experts for various reasons or are unsure how to deal with experts in the context of a court case. And uh, this resulted in a regular schooling of young judges with topics such as where and how do I uh, find an expert, how do I formulate the question he has to answer, what do I do when there's a conflict, what measures are there if it misses deadlines, etc. So schooling of uh, judges is also uh, very important, not only uh, of the experts. The Chamber of Commerce and other chambers that appoint experts, they organize regular conferences for experts, judges, and attorneys to discuss and improve the cooperation as well. And they're lucky if so many um, lawyers and experts come to those uh, conferences as it's here today. Also, my court, the District Court of Kiel, organized open court days for experts, judges, and attorneys and invited them to a day with a panel discussion and workshop uh, on certain topics. The feedback was exceptionally positive. The atmosphere between judges, attorneys, and experts is noticeably um, benefiting from that. The experts, uh, it has turned out, often considered the court uh, as a closed shop and they felt much more welcome and accepted in this world that used to be so strange to them earlier. So open court days helped a lot as well. And what also seems to be a good idea is to install a judge in the court administration to be responsible for expert matters. I have the honor to have this position in the District Court of Kiel, and I am there for my colleagues if they have any general questions dealing with experts. I have a collection of literature and decisions dealing with experts in my office, and I can also be addressed by experts if they have questions or conflicts, or if they have been recently been uh, publicly appointed and sworn in and want to introduce themselves to the judges. To come to an end, I believe that experts have a very important role in a judi judicial system. It is their outstanding competence, trustworthiness, and their independence that guarantees judges to have the true factual basis of a case and draw the right, right conclusions from it as well. Hence, the law must provide a way to guarantee the outstanding quality of court experts. And the system of public appointment and swearing in is one way to reach that goal. In addition, experts and judges must receive regular training and communicate well on how to deal with each other and with the cases they are working on together. Only through this we can achieve what justice is there for, fair, balanced, rapid, and most of all, right decisions. I thank you very much for your attention, and I'm looking forward to your questions and the discussion. Now, I would like to ask uh, the speakers, uh, lecturers, to come around the table. As uh, um, behind the table, it will be easier to address the questions in the microphone.
Now, your questions to the speakers, please. Feel free to ask questions not only about the presentations that you saw today, but also about other problem issues uh, about which you would like to know how things are done in Germany, the UK, or Sweden. And perhaps uh, there are questions which you are not able to ask um, otherwise or elsewhere. Um, your questions, please. I have the following question. If I understood correctly, uh, the German civil procedure law uh, provide for uh, deadlines for the expertise. If that is the case, then how are these deadlines established? Stated in the, it's stated in the law that usually we have to set a deadline. Um, these deadlines, they are never followed, I might say. Um, <laughs> we, most of the time you, we write, um, we send the case to the experts saying they have to hand in the report within three months. Um, then the expert needs documents from the parties. The parties are on holiday. They need a prolongation for that. Then one month is over. Then they need uh, an on-site visit. They can't find a date together. Another month is over until they find it. And then the expert needs a laboratory and so on. So it gets longer and longer and longer. And um, if we, the court, knows what's happening, some of the courts say, OK, I know there's a problem finding a date for the on-site visit because everybody must be allowed to come there. They have to, the expert can't go there alone. Then uh, most of the judges say, it's fine. I know what's happening. He's not, uh, he's not forgetting the case or something. Um, other judges, when the three months are over, they set a new deadline and um, in the same letter, <laughs> They, um, they say if this deadline isn't followed, the expert has to pay a fee. Mm -hmm. um, so I, don't, I personally, uh, personally don't, don't use that measure a lot, but we can uh, threaten uh, the, the, the expert with a fee that he has to pay if, he, if the, the expert's report doesn't come in time. Um, we are allowed to do it, and the law wants us to do it more, but my personal opinion is as long as I know why it's taking so long, it's no problem with me because it's most of the time it's the parties. That's the reason. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Zviedrija, Lielbritānijā, ir kaut kādi termiņi noteikti likumi? What about Sweden and the UK? Are there any deadlines set by your legislation for the experts report? In the, in the UK, for production of forensic material, deadlines are actually set by contracts between the police forces and the forensic providers, because in, the, in England and Wales anyway, I should say not Scotland, Scotland is different. In England and Wales, all of the forensic work is carried out by private providers. So police forces must pay for the forensic services, so contracts come with that, which um, determine costs and time. Yes. Uh, yeah. Um, we uh, we set the we give an estimate estimate the time for deliverance, and that is given automatically in our um, computer systems. That the uh, so for the various. Um, Depending on, depending on the investigation, it could be anything for three, from three days to three months. Uh, so we, and then we can change that if there are circumstances that, that occur during the investigation or our investigation that, for instance, prolongs. Um, that's usually the problem, that it uh, becomes long. Then we can change that. that. And we, have, we do have, we have investigations that are very, very fast, and we have those where we have problems with handling times. And usually it's due to uh, that we don't have enough manpower. Um, then it will, then things sort of, we, things pile up. Um, so, yeah, that, but we don't, we, don't, we don't have any formal agreement. But there is, of course, a 
constant communication. So we have like points of contact. We try to avoid uh, individual, individual um, uh, forensic experts should not uh, be burdened with too many phone calls or emails from, from prosecutors. And, mm -hmm. and, and we have points of contacts in different areas that take care of that. And then they can look at the flows and, and they can give an estimate on when things are going to be ready. But we also have, as I said, an automatic system for that. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Well, your time. Also. More questions, please. I have the following question with regard to the deadlines you mentioned. In order to set the deadlines, how many cases? Does an expert work on simultaneously to meet those deadlines reasonably? Thank you. Perhaps this question is addressed more to uh, Virgit and Gabriela, or Kelly, maybe. Depends. I know that our DNA experts has uh, more than 50 cases running at the same time. But they don't do everything. I mean, they are res case responsible. And now by a case, I should point out that I said we had 160,000 cases. We don't have 160,000 court cases. Uh, then we would be a very criminally ridden country. Uh, that is, we define a case when, when there, there is a request for a DNA investigation, for instance. Uh, so in a court case, there could be 20 different uh, forensic uh, investigations done, and in each of these investigations, there could be 20 analysis. Uh, so, the case is, is our definition of cases, not your definition. Um, yeah, uh, so I know that, that um, a forensic uh, expert in DNA can have more than 50 cases sim simultaneously, but she, he or she doesn't do the actual work because we have that's done by the lab. Uh, the lab personnel um, in another area where, where the expert is doing more of the work himself or herself. Um, hopefully they have less cases. Um, so it could be anything from a few up to over 50. In, in England and Wales, it's, it's about priority. So although you have a, a high workload, there will be different deadlines depending on when the case arrives on your desk. There will be different priorities depending on the case type. So a burglary will probably have a, a, a quicker turnaround than a, a murder case which takes priority. And of course there, are some, there will always be some conflict of interest and that's then down to the management to decide. In the northeast of England, the northeastern police forces have a very good system that they meet, I think it's once a week, and they get together and they determine between themselves which, court, which cases are their priority. So they remove the burden from the forensic provider, which I think is a very good system because we get through uh, the investigations that the, the, the police forces needs and court needs as a priority first. That, that sounds like a very good system. Mm. We, we also have these different flows. So we have a, a, or lanes. So we have a, a, in DNA, for instance, there, is, there are a, a part of the organization that is only doing volume crime. And they do it very, they have a very fast turnaround times. So they are specialized on that. But of course, they don't do as much than in each case, like the ones that are working on uh, murder cases or there is another branch that are working on sexual assault cases. So, this, it's, so they are like specialized and then they have different turnaround times. Um, I would very much appreciate if the Swedish police had these conferences and um, made these decisions themselves on what we should prioritize because now it's often the case that there are, as I said, police investigators and prosecutors calling us from different, and they all want priority. Uh, and then we have these very high profile cases where we can run just one case. We, we, just, we just stop everything and run this particular case and then we can run it through in hours. But then everything else has to wait, of course. Yeah. Yeah. 
I don't know if the civil law is also um, interesting for you and how the, how many cases the experts have there uh, or not. <laughs> for us, it's a it's a question of um, who to choose out of the pool of experts because we know that some experts really have a lot of cases. And in civil law, it's not as urgently as in criminal law, obviously. So they usually they work like one case, next case. So if, if we know that one expert has many cases, we just choose another one. So that's what I meant by uh, it's so important to find the right expert in the beginning. On the other hand, it has to be one who can solve the question also. So sometimes it's really difficult, and that's why we're always looking for good experts. So I only can add that in Lithuania, we also do not perform simultaneously a lot of forensic examination. I should not say cases. For example, for road accident, you begin and finish. Exception is when you ask for additional material. Handwriting as well, but uh, never the, you ne our experts never do one case, begins in the morning one case, after, in the afternoon brings, uh, takes another. So it's backlog and that situation. <coughs> Question about criminal law. In view of the uh, development of technologies and science, during the the last uh, five, ten years, what are the new uh, forms of expertise that have appeared and which are uh, being uh, adopted, uh, which will be used in the future as uh, there are uh, uh, types or techniques of expertise which are used, which are described in literature, but uh, from your um, uh, experience, what are the state-of-the-art expertise is something new that will be introduced in the practice. A little comment. Thank you for your question. But I think that people who are working on the cases and investigating them could answer this question. As experts, role is to help the investigator, the prosecutor, the judge. Uh, I mean, first, you must specify which issues are most important to you. Tell us, and then we will work on how to help you. We could uh, start uh, a discussion about uh, some new methods, but if uh, the experts start enumerating uh, the existing methods, perhaps our honorable uh, investigators in the audience will uh, uh, be shocked and overwhelmed and will say all of this is new to us. It's in the ex uh, examination, 3D scanning, so on and so on. <laughs> Cloud computer examinations. Endless. Endless, yes. <laughs> um, in, in, in the UK, the the trend is moving towards digital, so examination of, of phones, phone signals, and tracking people through social media and, and, and so on. And that seems to be taking over DNA even. So for, for, for a change, DNA is the, the poor brother. <laughs> but I think what is important to remember, and one of the reasons why I talked about fibres is, although we can move on with technology and everyone is looking for the next, the, the next expertise, we need, still need to use the right tool. And sometimes the traditional forensic evidence types are actually the ones that are going to provide you with the best evidence. So it's having an understanding of what that evidence type can provide you with and what it can't provide you with. Uh, digital evidence is um, emerging, uh, as you said, very fast, and it also poses a lot of challenges for the legal community. Mm -hmm. I know that Swedish judges, they have a big difficulty now to understand the cases when it comes to, to digital forensics. They have also a challenge. They are also difficulty understanding the experts, uh, because you, usually they are experts that are called in, is, yes. like in a civil case, from from many different parties, not just from the forensic uh, institute, but also for companies, from Google, from Facebook, whatever. And it, it is for the judge to to decide 
who is the most credible of this. And it's, it's, this area is very difficult to, to, I mean, you have to know a lot about this, this the technology and the, what's happening out there. And, and suddenly it's not even physical evidence anymore. It's, it's happening in the cloud. It's happening on the internet. Uh, so that poses a big challenge for the entire legal system um, dealing with this. But it's there, so um, yeah. Yeah, there's been, there's been a, you, you may be aware of this, but there's been a lot of challenges in the UK lately with disclosure regarding uh, digital information. So the amount of information that can be collected from somebody's smartphone mm -hmm. is so overwhelming. Mm -hmm that not everything has been examined and therefore not everything has been disclosed and information that hasn't been looked at could be helpful to the defendant and it's only when it gets to court and the judge um, instructs the, the police to investigate the entire thing that the, the, the defendant's um, evidence comes through. So there's, there's massive challenges uh, regarding it in the UK. I would like uh, to take the opportunity to use my moderating role and ask a provocative question. In some judges' decisions, I have seen um, the following wording. Since uh, the forensic expert uh, opinion is given as a uh, um, possibility, it means that the expert is in doubt and all doubts are to be interpreted in favor of uh, the defendant. True or false? Why expert? So a forensic expert's opinion in the form of possibility is a sign of their doubts. Yes or no? <laughs> Maybe it's for, for somebody else. Yeah. 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 No, it's not, uh, it's not a sign uh, for doubt. It is uh, one means of evidence, and we have heard this morning what exactly it means, and that is it's um, like, yeah, like a weight that, that counts on one side, and then you have to look at the other evidence, and then you have to decide whether or not you're convinced. Um, but it's uh, definitely not a sign of doubt, mm. or not enough doubt to, uh, well, to let one party lose. That's, it's not as easy as that. <laughs> Actually, it's a sign of, of, of honesty and transparency. Yeah. And, uh, of course, uh, in, as, as um, sort of natural, I mean, we're free from the science, we're scientists, and there is a misconception that science means being sure, uh, whereas everyone who is in legal business knows that there are those, those you have to always weigh things. And actually, science is not about being sure. It's, it's, about, it's the same thing. You have, you have evidence and it points one direction or the other direction. So uh, we are really in the same boat, sorry. We won't very seldom give you a yes or no answer, even though it would make your life easier. Um, but we are we are very alike in that way. We, we have to, to, to work in this realm, realm of uncertainty, all of us, and work together. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> I, I couldn't agree more. Um, I, I think the, the word that you used is, is really true, uncertainty. We have to get, become more comfortable with uncertainty. If we, we, there's no point pretending that we can be 100% sure either way. We, we, we absolutely can't. We can, we can just say how much along that scale we, we are certain. Um, and, and uncertainty is everywhere. The decision of, of a jury, of a judge, of, on somebody's innocence or guilt, there's, you, you can never be sure. You're not 100% sure. It's beyond reasonable doubt, so there's still uncertainty there. So we, we just have to accept uncertainty um, and, and manage our expectations, I think, surrounding it.
um, Lils Baldis. Thank you very much. I think uh, this has exhausted uh, the supply of our questions. I think uh, we need to face the facts. We have uh, extended uh, uh, the schedule. We thank all the lecturers, all the presenters. And I think we need to also thank um, our supporters, the technical staff, and the interpreters. And of course, we are happy to thank the organizers and the hosts. Ladies, thank you very much. Without you, we would have uh, taken even more to discuss. Thank you for your presence and see you next time. Goodbye.